This handsome man was Saint Andrew. Saint Andrew was a glorified Roman general who lived under the rule of the Roman Emperor Galerius. Galerius liked persecuting Christians, especially in the territory of Syria. And it just so happens that the commander Andrew was a Christian in Syria. The reason Syria was such a dreadful place for Christians is because of the military commander of Syria, called Antiochus, who really hated Christians since they wouldn't let him worship his idolatry. Antiochus had many soldiers under his command, who also shared his love for idols. However, among these, like a rose among thorns, there shone in secret the martyr and faithful servant of God, Andrew. At that time, it happened that the Persians invaded the borderlands in Syria. Ha ha, puny Romans. Antiochus wasn't well prepared for such an attack. <coughs> since he was busy forging a bronze couch for no apparent reason. But he remembered the military skills of Andrew and summoned him to join his inner council. Andrew, your valiant deeds and the many distinctions which you have won against the enemy are known both to me and to the one who holds the scepter. Hello there. I entrust to your valor this great and unexpected war in order that your reputation will grow even more through the present conflict. When Andrew and his faithful soldiers heard these words, trusting not in numbers, nor in weapons, or in armor, but only in Almighty God, he arranged a few soldiers, small in number, into battle formation and led this against the enemy who had been arrayed against him. When the battle was about to begin, Andrew suddenly realized that he didn't inform his soldiers about the knowledge of God and Christ. This is the right time for you to come to a full knowledge of God in heaven, for you will immediately recognize that the gods of the pagans are really demons. My God, the one who made heaven and earth, is the true God. Accordingly, since he is all-powerful, he helps those who call upon him, he reveals the mighty and more, and they ward off the attacks of their enemies. So behold, see that the enemy stands opposite to us in large numbers, and have proved stronger than us until now. But come on, put aside your error, call with me upon he who is truly God, and you will see them dead and driven away before you like smoke or dust from the threshing floor. By making his chosen men witnesses of this battle and miracle, the holy man of God led them to knowledge of the Lord. Since the course of the war had gone according to the holy man's plan, and he had triumphed over the Medes, he, together with his entourage, was adorned with the due rewards at the court of Antiochus, as was fitting. Some men became jealous of Andrew's success and charged him and his soldiers with confessing the worshipping of Jesus Christ. Antiochus had the matter investigated and when he learned the truth he called Andrew and his followers. Since you know how and with what sort of tortures I killed many men who had confessed their faith in Christ and that I did not take pity on them, with what object or hope do you now make your case on behalf of the Crucified One? 
You greatly strengthen my resistance by the things which you have said. For of all those you named, having been inflicted with terrible tortures by your authority, have emerged victors and carry their athletic crowns in the presence of Christ, who is God. Why would I, a servant of my Lord Jesus Christ, not be eager also to remain forever constant in order to enjoy the same rewards with them? God, I hate those crickets. After this speech, Antiochus ordered him to be brought bound into his presence, to be questioned in front of all, and to confess clearly whether he wished to obey either the commands of the emperor or his god. And when, in the presence of men, angels, and the whole of nature, Andrew confessed Christ clearly and courageously, the most haughty governor then devised a wicked punishment for him. Since Andrew has clearly achieved many things in the wars, and has been crowned for quite a few victories, we have contrived for him to find a means of rest and relaxation. He ordered his bronze couch to be readied and heated. It then became apparent to all why he made that bronze couch earlier. Flashback. End of flashback. He ordered Andrew to be placed upon it. However, Andrew very cheerfully leapt onto the couch. <laughs> The couch brought him relief and peace of mind, as the fire yielded to the great fervor of his faith. Antiochus then proceeded to bring forth some of Andrew's soldiers. Smiling, he ordered their outstretched hands to be firmly nailed to the wood. Do you think this is enjoyable? We are imitating our Lord Christ, who was nailed to the wood of the cross for us, so this is great! Actually, it really hurts. Will you change your beliefs and turn from the faith of the Christians if such torture was applied to you? Well, it actually looks quite fun. I can't wait to try that attraction. Antiochus then locked Andrew and the soldiers up in prison. Completely confused about what just happened, he proceeded to ask the emperor's opinion on the matter. Even though Andrew and his Christians were a bunch of crazy people, the emperor also realized that Andrew was a distinguished officer and his soldiers were some of the best infantry in the army. So just executing them would result in a lot of murmuring and trouble. So he ordered Antiochus that he was to get rid of Andrew and his men in secret and by means of trickery and foul play. He suggested that Antiochus release them from jail and grant them pardon for what had already been done. But he was to pursue them secretly a little while later, as if for another offense. Andrew decided to go to the city of Tarsus with his faithful soldiers, in the Roman province of Kilikia. The reason Andrew chose this destination was because he heard that true Christians actually needed to be baptized. So he sought out Bishop Peter of Tarsus to perform the baptism. Hello there. Antiochus then soon heard of Andrew's plans and departure. Oh no, he didn't! Oh yes, he did! No, he didn't! Yes, he did! I just saw it! Alright, take it easy. He quickly sent a letter to the governor of Kilikia, who was called Seleucus, to urge him to capture or kill Andrew and his soldiers. Since Seleucus was, much like Antiochus, not very fond of Christians, he happily obliged. And so Seleucus sent out his best lightly armed units to Tarsus. While Andrew was still getting baptized, 
He learned of this development and fled from Tarsus to Texanite. Doing so not out of fear, but in fulfillment of the Lord's command, which states, whenever you are persecuted in one city, flee to another. Seleucus was not about to give up his pursuit, however, and followed Andrew and his faithful men. Andrew travelled through the whole Taurus mountains until he reached Tamalin. He continued into the territory of a village called Orkesti, which is in Armenia Prima, near the distinguished metropolis of Melitin, and reached the regions called Kausurius and the Karabates, and then headed for the region of Androkalon. Seleucus was just as confused as anyone who would try following the path Andrew had taken. However, he eventually learned the location of Andrew's whereabouts. Finally, Andrew and his men were led by God into the so-called Straits of Taurus. This place had two opposing mountain peaks which gradually came together and almost joined to one another, and the narrows produced as a result of the river passing downwards between them are almost impossible. Seleucus, knowing now where Andrew has sought refuge, sent his army after them to the strait. Right at the time of this tense and dangerous situation, Andrew decided to hold a communal prayer with his soldiers. O oh, beloved soldiers and children of mine, now is the day of salvation. Let us stand in love of God, lifting our hands not to ward off the persecutors, but in praise of the God who has deemed us worthy to obtain a share and portion among all the blessed. We will beseech and invoke him by saying that which the famous Stephen, first of the martyrs, said as he was being stoned. Lord Jesus Christ, receive the souls of your servants, for into your hands we commend them. O oh God, great and almighty, accept my prayer, and that of all those with me who have unswervingly preserved their faith in you, protect those who flee to this place, saving them from all evil and need, grant them sanctity of body and soul, and where our humble blood flows, let there be a healing spring there, where evil spirits are condemned and casted out. To the glory of your blessed, holy and awe-inspiring name, and that of your only Son, our God Jesus Christ, and of your holy and life-giving Spirit, forever and ever. Amen. Because of these prayers, their pursuers now had ample time to catch the praying Christians and proceeded to slaughter them like lambs. The pagans killed them and filled the nearby river with their blood. In accordance with the holy prayer of the martyr, the place became a spring pouring forth a harvest of cures of every kind. This spring has continued to flow in abundance to the present day and provides the appropriate cure for each person. For as this account has already revealed, the martyr was deemed worthy of all the greater gifts of grace. He had especially the grace of driving out demons. From there his reputation reached not only those who were nearest, those about the place itself and in the region, but those who were far away, and those who were even further away. So this blessed man completed his course, together with the whole of his brave divinely chosen unit, on the 19th of August on the Lord's Day at the second hour. <laughs>